This lecture is the lecture on social psychology given to regular psychology class on May the 24th. We start with cognitive, cognitive dissonance, conformity, and obedience. Cognitive dissonance is when your actions and your beliefs don't align. Uh, oftentimes, this is due to your actions being influenced by other people. When we don't have that alignment between our actions and our beliefs, uh, we experience tension, and that's called cognitive dissonance. And we work to eliminate that dissonance by uh, um, by either changing our actions or our beliefs. Um, but most of the time, we change our beliefs because changing our actions in the face of other people is really hard. People also conform as a result of the influence of other people. And conformity is when we uh, kind of change our beliefs or change our behavior to go along with that of the group. <clears throat> the question is, why do we do it? Well, normative social influence says that we will change our beliefs or actions because we don't like feeling different. We don't like feeling that tension that comes from feeling different. So we call this normative social influence. But on the other hand, we also have informational social influence. And that's where the power of a group basically convinces you that your belief or your behavior is wrong. Uh, where it changes your mind. And so that would be informational social influence. Obedience is when we uh, obey the directives or orders of an authority figure. <clears throat> uh, most human beings will obey authority in most situations. But when is obedience the greatest? Well, two ways. One, when it's an environment built for obedience. So for example, students will obey a teacher in a classroom because that's the setting from which they're, they're expected to obey. Uh, but they may not obey them if they see them outside of school and they try to tell them what to do. On the other hand, the other reason that makes obedience the greatest is when people perceive an authority figure to be an authority figure. And this is really powerful because when they don't perceive the directive coming from an authority figure, they don't feel like it has validity. Uh, and when it comes from an authority figure, they feel like this is what they're supposed to do. And most of the time, people will obey it. When you have more than one person together, especially more than two, you definitely have a group. But sometimes groups are just collections of people. So what keeps groups together? Norms are rules, either written or unwritten, that all groups, all members of a group are expected to follow. Ideology is the set of shared beliefs or shared goals that everyone in the group maintains. And commitment is the idea that each person in a group not only supports one another, but also supports the group as a whole. <coughs> Sometimes being in a group will affect our performance. When we do better due to the presence of a group, like for example, an athlete that might get more focused and more confident being in front of a lot of people, we call this social facilitation because what happens is that the performance will improve. But on the same time, there are also a lot of people who get nervous being in front of a group uh, where they get uh, anxious and tense uh, <clears throat> and their performance will suffer. We call this social inhibition. Sometimes people are in groups and they're lazy because they expect everybody else to pick up the slack and do the work. Uh, we call this idea social loafing. De-individuation is when you have uh, a person, an individual, doing a behavior that they might not normally do due to the fact that they're an anonymous or faceless member of a mob. Um, you can see an example of that uh, with what happened on January 6th. Most people wouldn't, who were there wouldn't do that on their own, but because they were a part of a mob, uh, their behaviors changed. Oftentimes, when we interact in groups, uh, it causes us to be more extreme. Uh, we see this with most, most groups, and it's called group polarization. And the big result of this, the reason for this, is due to group think. And group think is when a person will change their beliefs uh, to meet those of the group. And then generally, because of group polarization, they tend to get more extreme. When you have a group that is very large and very entrenched, many times they establish their own set of beliefs, behaviors, traditions, and so on. Uh, this is known as a culture. 
Uh, most countries or ethnicities in the world have unique cultures due to unique traditions, beliefs, behaviors, holidays that they celebrate, foods they eat, languages that they speak. Though on the planet, there are two types of uh, cultures. Collectivist cultures are cultures in which every person in the culture is willing to make a sacrifice for the greater good. But individualist cultures, ones that practice individualism, are ones in which each individual is kind of on their own. Um, and they, while they will still help others, uh, it's their choice and uh, will definitely not always sacrifice in order to serve the greater good. Many times different cultures are opposed to one another and that can lead to hostility. It can lead to uh, people being uh, at odds with one another for a, a number of different reasons. Sometimes beliefs and behaviors and feelings uh, become harmful. Um, and when they harm an individual due to the group that they're a part of, uh, we call this prejudice. And so this is when an individual is uh, delivered either prejudicial beliefs, emotions, or actions uh, due to the fact that they're in a group that's different from one who's uh, being prejudicial toward them. Prejudicial beliefs are called stereotypes. Uh, and these can be ones that are harmful um, or even ones that will say good things about uh, a certain group, whether it be race or gender or sexual orientation or whatever. And even the ones that seem good still harm individuals because they don't look at the individual as a whole and they just assume that, that that's how that person is due to the part a group that they're a part of. Many times prejudicial beliefs will lead to prejudicial emotions. Um, generally, this shows itself in either hostility or fear. Uh, sometimes hostile if they're, one group is morally opposed to another, and fear if one group feels threatened by another. And finally, we have prejudicial action, and that's where people carry out uh, behaviors towards another that are harmful due to the culture that they're a part of. Um, and this is called discrimination. Uh, and discrimination can be overt, such as the saying of racial slurs, but it can also be uh, subtle, like uh, people being followed in a store because they may be suspected of stealing. But why does this happen? Well, it's due to in-groups and out-groups. In-groups are groups that we share characteristics with. There, we may be part of many different in-groups. Out-groups are groups that are directly opposed to us. And out-groups tend to be not every group that's different from us, but ones that are in a direct opposition. A lot of times what occurs is that we carry out in-group bias. And in-group bias is when we excuse or rationalize uh, a person's behavior that is part of our in-group, mainly because they're a member of our in-group. And the reason for this is because we can often see ourselves in their place. And we don't, we don't want to think that we could do such negative or harmful actions as well. And a lot of times with an in-group bias, there's also an out-group bias. We're also more, with an in-group bias, we're more likely when a bad behavior happens to think, oh, well, that's the situation, there was the reason for it. Yet out-groups, with the out-groups, we are often more likely to blame the person, the individual for who they are and what group they're a part of. And this often leads to the scapegoat theory, which says that when a bad thing happens, uh, oftentimes, uh, accusers will, uh, or, or just people at, at, uh, as a whole will, uh, accuse a person of an out group of being responsible for that because they are in direct opposition with the group that that individual is a part of. Now we look at attraction. With att attraction, we're picking people. We're picking people to be our friends. We're picking people to be our partners. We're picking people uh, to be our acquaintances. But how do we choose them? Well, there are six different uh, ways that we pick our partners. We call these the laws of attraction. One is proximity. And proximity is when you're physically close to another person. The second is reward values. And reward values are when, we, when a person um, often gives us uh, some sort of reinforcement for our behavior because it validates our behavior. It makes us feel good. Uh, 
The third one is physical appearance. And this just isn't romantic uh, attraction. Also, interpersonal friendships, too. We often will pick the pick people who we perceive to be at our same level of attraction as us uh, when we are picking our friends. So if we believe that we're very attractive, then we're more likely to gravitate and make friends with people who are who we would perceive to be very attractive, attractive as well, and even in friend groups. Uh, the fourth one is approval, and then this is when someone uh, doesn't necessarily uh, give you a gift or a reward, um, but at the same time uh, encourages the behavior that you're doing um, and validates it and makes it feel like it's the right thing to be done. Uh, and finally, the last two are kind of go together. Uh, similarity is when we share similar values, uh, and complementarity is when we... Uh, when we kind of back up each other's weaknesses. Ultimately, this leads us to personal relationships. And this is relationships. This is where you, a person will have a connection with another single individual. This can be a family member. This could be a friend. This could be a romantic partner. In every relationship, three things are needed. Equity, self-disclosure, and positive support. Equity is when we are sharing the load, sharing the work. Uh, self-disclosure is when we're open and honest with the other individual uh, because lies lead to mistrust. And finally, positive support, uh, because in relationships, um, we want the person that we're connected to to feel that uh, we're in support of the behaviors that they're doing, of the choices that they're making. And so positive support really helps with this. And so this ultimately leads us to the triangular theory of love. And the triangular theory of love says that there are three types of love, intimacy, passion, and commitment. Intimacy is when we're emotionally close to somebody else. So you can be very intimate uh, with like a very good friend. Um, oftentimes intimacy is mislabeled in the media, um, but what they're often mistaking is passion. And that's the physical act of love. Uh, and then finally, you have commitment. Uh, and commitment is when each person is devoted to one another. Uh <clears throat> And obviously, like you can see from the triangle here, when you combine the three types of love uh, in different ways, you get different types of love from com companionate love to romantic love. Uh, and But finally, the ultimate love is known as con con ah, consummate love, and that's when you have intimacy and passion and commitment. Finally, we look at cooperation and conflict. Altruism is why we help. Altruism is the term that we use when we help and assist other people. But sometimes we don't help. If you remember from the film clip that we saw uh, last week on the bystander effect, um, sometimes when we're around other people, we expect them to do it. We expect them to pick up the slack and we don't feel a sense of a, str a strong responsibility due to the effect of other people. And that sometimes will cause everybody to feel that way and the person that needs help may not get help. But a lot of times we do help. So why do we help? Well, three different ideas tells us why we help. The social exchange theory says that uh, when someone does something good for us, we are more likely than to do good things for others. Kind of like the pay it forward idea. Someone does something good for us and then we go and pay it forward to somebody else. The reciprocity gnome tells us that uh, when we do something good for somebody else, they'll do something good for us. So kind of like the exchange. Um, so this is with a single person. Uh, and uh, so oftentimes if someone helps us, then we'll help them back. And then finally, we have the social responsibility norm, uh, which is we help because we feel it is morally correct, like it's the right thing to do. Sometimes, though, two parties can be in conflict with one another. And conflict um, is really difficult uh, because you'll have two individuals or two groups or two countries uh, who are uh, at odds with one another. Um, and this creates hostility. Um, and one of the main causes of all conflict is something that we call social traps. Um, and social traps are when we feel like the only way that we can get ahead is by putting somebody else down, by being at odds with another individual, the I win you lose type, type of idea. Um, what we have found through a variety of studies in both economics and psychology is that the way to get the, the probability of getting the best uh, direct odds from a situation 
is to not only do what's best for yourself or what's best for your own group, but also with the group at large. But most people fall into, most people in a lot of groups fall into the social traps of saying, I need to get ahead by making sure that I beat that other group. Um, and the other thing that often will cause major conflicts, ones that are long lasting, are something called mirror image perceptions. And mirror image perceptions are when you have two sides, whether it be individuals or countries or groups, and each side sees their own beliefs and their own behavior as not only right, but morally correct, like holy, while the other side is evil. The problem is, is that the other side believes the same thing about them. And so you get this, what's called a mirror image perception, where sometimes you each see the bad in one another and you only can see the good in yourself, and that leads to long lasting conflict. And then finally, self-fulfilling prophecies. If there's an individual who says, I think that person's going to hate me, then sometimes they may unconsciously uh, adjust their behaviors, be more standoffish and more aggressive uh, with that individual, which then may generate animosity and actually cause that person to really hate them. Um, we call this idea a self-fulfilling prophecy and more, more than just conflict situations too. It's the idea that sometimes if you have a belief you can subconsciously um, cause that belief to become more true. And especially this is a, a negative beliefs are, are very strong with this. So how do we make peace? Well, it comes to the four C's. The four C's are contact, cooperation, communication, conciliation. Very simple contact. You have to be connected in order to stop a conflict. Cooperate. Sometimes Two sides that are at conflict with one another may choose to cooperate because they have shared goals. We have we call this superordinate goals. It's when uh, a shared goal is more important than the conflict, causing two opposing groups to have to work together. Uh, and then finally, uh, the last two, communication. Um, a lot of times the way to make peace is to communicate. And where one side can convince the other that the win-lose situation that they're both in at the moment like one person wins or one group wins and one group loses, uh, can be turned into uh, a situation in which both parties win. Um, and then finally, the last C is sometimes maybe the most powerful and oftentimes the most hard. Uh, and this is called conciliation. And conciliation is when uh, one side in a conflict will basically own up to it and say, you know what, I was wrong. Um, and maybe there's a way to kind of figure this out and admit our errors. And ultimately, that's how we make peace. And that is the end of lecture.